You know, one of the big problems when you uh, are, um, use emails and subscribe to various things, you get inundated with all kinds of stuff coming your way and it clogs in your entree. And then you discover that wonderful IT tool called the unsubscribe button. And you press it and life gets better and better. 2.30 service today, Simon Foster, the expert on all things spiritually IT related, will be teaching you how to hit the unsubscribe link on the devil's way of life. Amen and amen. amen. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off unsubscribe your old self, which is being corrupted and so forth, and to put on, subscribe to the new self. I think it's a brilliant way of presenting the fact that we can say no, don't want that, don't want that, and we can say yes, yes, I want that. And the that we don't want is the old, and the that we want is new, and his name is Jesus. So come along at uh, 2.30 service for that. And as I mentioned, of course, tonight at 5.30, Robert Lerden's going to be with us. There is something so wonderful about the gift of prophecy when it comes from God and when people speak a clear, genuine word from the Lord into your life. It is not controlling. It's not authoritarian. It's in submission to the Holy Spirit and it's in tandem, in sympathy, in parallel to what God is saying to you in your own heart. For we all have the Holy Spirit. Today I want to speak to you about when God speaks through people. Let's pray. Father, we ask you that this message today would release us into fresh enthusiasm to embrace the genuinely prophetic, to learn how to sift through and discern in all the claims that people make about what they're saying and find within that the genuine manifestation of a God-given gift of prophecy, a word that will genuinely encourage us and help us in our journey of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're turning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. The Apostle Paul is coming to his concluding remarks in a letter to the Thessalonians in which he's dealing with many things dealing with the authority of the gospel, dealing also with some people who are going astray in their teaching. And in the second letter, we find that they were prophesying silly things about the second coming. And Paul calls them back to stand in line with the revelation of God through the Bible and with walking in openness day by day to the Holy Spirit. So that's the kind of territory we are in, and Paul brings his first letter into land with these words. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. 
See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now I see the key statement there, which everything else centers around. The headline message, the key point that Paul is saying is, don't quench the spirit. Why would we ever want to quench the Holy Spirit, to diminish his influences in our lives, and in some way to block what he wants to do. No, no, no. We want to be open to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is gentle and loving. He will work with patience, and he will bring us into illumination, revelation, encourage us when we are down, warn us when we're in danger. Oh, no, no, the Holy Spirit is our partner, the one who walks with us. He is Jesus' representative here on earth. No, no, we would never want to quench the Holy Spirit. We want to be open to the Holy Spirit. Can I have a big Holy Spirit? Amen. Amen. And in many ways, as I look at these verses, we see either side of that statement Lots of different ways in which we can avoid quenching the Holy Spirit. And we'll come to it, but right there towards the end is one important way I want to focus on today, not to quench the Holy Spirit, by opening our hearts and aspiring to being ready to receive and give genuine words from the Lord to one another. It's a, it's a small part of how God speaks to us and leads us, but I want to focus on it today. I want to see the gift of prophecy flourish in the church and that we might actually increase in prophetic levels of anointing and so much hangs on hearing the voice of God. So let's be encouraged that God is a God who speaks to us. Uh, we are learning how to hear him. And we're also learning how he will use sometimes the gift of prophecy in this whole process. There is nothing more wonderful than receiving a word like that in any situation. And I have over the years experienced many times when the graciousness of the Spirit manifests in someone speaking something which is just a beautiful word from the Lord to my life that unlocks for me maybe some things that I'm unsure about, maybe some firmer direction or some encouragement concerning a course of action. Many, many, many times. I remember one very definitive time so I had just uh, come back to London from the city of Cambridge where I'd spent a couple of years studying, catching up on some O-levels and some A-levels. I left school at the age of 15 and uh, catching up on that and also studying uh, theology uh, with, through a course operated by Cambridge University. And this was for me an important preparation for what I felt to be a call upon my life. I did not predetermine it to say, I'm called to be a pastor. I want to be ordained. I want to stand up here. I want to do this or that. I, I, I didn't know the place. I didn't really know where God wanted me to be. But I did know that I had my home in Kensington Temple. And I did know that there was stuff in me that I think God wanted me to develop and give out. But I was praying about this, and you know, you can't go knocking on the door and say, hello, I'm a man of God, 
and I, God's told me to come and work for you. You, you wait on the Lord, and uh, you wait for his response. And, and for me, the response, amongst other things, this wasn't the only thing, but this was a key thing. The response came when an elderly lady in the church, she probably was no older than I am now, but as I was 18 years of age, I thought she was competing with Methuselah, but never mind. And uh, she, she had a very particular way about her. She was a no-nonsense lady, Sister Kate. In those days, we didn't have members. We had sisters and brothers. Brother Colin, Sister Kate. And Sister Kate was a good, old-fashioned Pentecostal lady, both with long hair tied up in a bun and a hat. And she came to me one day and she said, I have a word from the Lord for you. And I thought, bring it on. What's happening? And to be really serious, it was very, it was classical good prophetic ministry because it wasn't overbearing, it wasn't controlling, it was offering something that she felt God was saying. She felt that God was saying that soon I'd come across a door, a door that others might ignore, a door to the side and a door that was quite narrow. But as you go through this door, she said, you will come across another door. This door will be bigger and broader. And as you go through that door, at this point, my memory fades out and history sets in. I, I can't promise you that through that word, uh, I could see everything that I now know. But what I do now know was that narrow door was a drug rehabilitation ministry attached to Kensington Temple, which led to a door opening here to be a junior minister and, 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 and still here today. And beyond that, there has been this enormous, almost global opportunity to serve God to the ends of the earth. How accurate was that very simple word? How encouraging to me and how key and crucial it was for me to have the confidence that God was actually leading me. And when things worked out like that, looking back on it, we could say, yeah, what a wonderful word from God. How many here have ever received a genuine word from God through somebody else speaking a word of prophecy. And it's proved to be right and genuine. Let me see. Okay, I thought there'd be more, but it's not a hard question. I just simply say that because often people come and say, oh, I've got a word for you. And you, and you think to yourself, oh, no, you haven't. And, you, you know, there's a lot of people who just use that uh, as, as a, a kind of means of communication, but we should be very careful. And it's all, all right to share what you think and, and uh, with people, but, but the moment you suggest that this, you are speaking from God, it's a whole different ball game. Uh, but but the, the point I want to make is that the gift of prophecy exists and it's a New Testament gift. It existed in the New Testament. Uh, not just the prophets and apostles who spoke the very word of God and to produce for us the scriptures, but there was another level of prophecy which people in the congregation as the Holy Spirit moved, operated. All may prophesy, prophesy uh, Paul says, all may prophesy, but not everybody is used to write scripture. And we don't need that anymore because the scripture is completed. So I want to talk more about that gift of prophecy that we know about today and that we experience today. So the Apostle Paul addresses this. He says, do not quench the spirit. Uh, do not despise prophecies. I want to pause there and imagine why he would want to say that, why he would need to say that. If you say to somebody, don't despise something, you might at least believe that they may be despising it or they may tend to despise it. So, so there must have been at that time people who were dismissing prophecies. Now, I wonder why that might be. One of the reasons I get from both 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians was there was so much rubbish out there. So many people saying whatever they felt like, being inspired by the imagination of their own hearts. And it, sometimes even, even worse than that, 
There are demonic elements at times that seek to speak into our lives through false prophecies, lying spirits. And there was a lot of it about, as I will show you in a moment. But Paul says, hang in there. No, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I suggest to you that there are in circulation many fake 50 pound notes, counterfeit notes. I'm not saying you have them, but, but because there is the counterfeit out there, you don't say, well, I'm not going to use money. It could be counterfeit. No, you check it, don't you? You learn how to check it. I get very nervous when I go into a shop and I present whatever banknotes it is and I 10, 10 pound note or something and they took it, take it and they look at it and I thought, I feel guilty or, 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 or you know, what have, I, what have I got? But actually they're just doing their business. They are checking it. We, we, we check to see whether it is real or not. That's how we deal with the counterfeit. But maybe these people at that time we're saying, do you know what? We're fed up of all these prophecies. We're not going to listen to any of them. And, and God is saying, no, don't, don't do that. Check it. Check it out. Test it. And when you found it to be genuine, hold on to it. Again, I think that corrects another testimony. Sorry, another, another issue today in churches. And um, I don't know, we find some people who are, so crazy for prophecy on one side and others who are so against it and we need to get people together and let's be more balanced. But the unbalance on the other side, apart from just rejecting and saying it's rubbish, on the other side is, is just believing everything and rushing after everything. And there are people who go from person to person to person. Can I have a word, please? Can I have a word, please? They never stop to take the word and do something about it. They run from prophecy to prophecy to prophecy. Well, God wants you rather to receive that word, hold on to that word, and you will go not from prophecy to prophecy to prophecy, but from fulfillment to fulfillment to fulfillment. Amen. amen. That's a good place to say a big amen. amen. And so th this is the kind of territory that we are in. And uh, let me just show you, uh, first of all, some of the things that Paul was thinking about. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Now in chapter 1, he talks about the coming of the Lord, and uh, there's various interactions with him in this church, questions and things that needs addressing. And so in his second letter, Paul becomes much more specific about the the, the reasons why prophecy had begun to get a bad reputation. 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 1 to 3, Paul says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to Him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word. Can you see it's so clear? either by a spirit, and that's really false prophecy. Not every spirit is from God. Test the spirits to see whether they be of God and from God. A lot of people today, even those who are not professing Christians, listen to all kinds of so-called prophecies. You can just tune into the internet and find people prophesying all over the place and and. and and, and it's very clear that the spirit by which they are speaking is not the spirit of God because that no time do they confess that Jesus is Lord. No time do they confess that Christ has come in the flesh and no time do they actually promote your Christian relationship with God. They're prophesying by another spirit a false spirit. And even today, that's the reason why some people just run away from this. I'm not going to listen to any prophecy. It could be the devil talking. Well, uh, I, I have more faith in God to speak to us than the devil to deceive us. However, we do need to test the spirits to see whether they're from God. Do not be alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or even a letter seeming to come from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come come. So there were prophecies, there were revelations, there were spirits speaking, 
There were people writing letters and this was the big thing. The day of the Lord has come. Jesus has already returned. And they say, what? Well, where is he? Aha, you'll have to wait on us. And they were adding to the word of God. They were giving a revelation that was not from God and they were messing with God's people. And I think that people got very discouraged by that. Some had fallen for it, I guess, and now discover that actually they were wrong, they'd been deceived. And so Paul, with a great ministry of pastor and teacher, says, no guys, don't, don't be shaken by this. Don't be alarmed because the truth is in the gospel, not what people add to it. The truth is in the revelation of scripture, not what people think or allow to uh, allow them to be deceived by. So he says, here's the thing. Do not be deceived. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. Now, Derek Prince used to say, if you think you can't be deceived, you already are. So all of us need to guard ourselves in this way. And then he, he corrects the false teaching with the accurate revelation of God that carries the full authority of Scripture because he was a living apostle delivering the infallible word from God. He said that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, the man of lawlessness is revealed, and so on. Now we'll come back to what that means on another day. But quite simply, Paul is saying, test everything by the Scripture. Do not just believe anything that you hear because there are false prophets and false teachers and what they can't find in the Bible, they make it up for themselves or worse still, carry it in from the demonic element and begin false revelation. So be careful when people claim dreams and visions, angelic visitations, and tell you to take as the word of God something that's not in the word of God or something that contradicts the word of God. Don't be alarmed, but be discerning. And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that there are times when I hear God and it it really proves that it was God. I know times, and we all know them, where perhaps we were mistaken, and that's why we must be very cautious even in our own lives. And discerning the will of God, hearing the voice of the Spirit, is so central, so crucial to all of our lives as Christians. In fact, I don't think there is a greater commitment that we could ever make apart from committing our lives to Christ in the first place is then committing our lives to the Holy Spirit, meaning that we make it our commitment to learn, to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, to discern the voice of God into our lives and to be willing to obey what God is saying. Of course, the chief way of doing that, as I'm saying, is the scripture. And there are many ways in which God will work in our lives to guide us and reveal his will to us. I mention many more of them in my book, Listening to God, which is on very special offer today because it goes alongside this teaching and preaching as I talk about the gift of prophecy. And we'll do a little more of that teaching on another occasion, but it's here for you so that you can catch up on this and also get ahead. But in, in, in my life, there was a tremendous turnaround many, many years ago when I discovered the significance of hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. And you might say, well, you should have known that before, perhaps. But I wonder how many of you today have really come to that place where you say, I'm going to make it my life goal to get to know God by learning to listen to him and to have very sensitive hearing skills and to learn to discern the voice of God, uh, however it comes to us, and how to surrender to that. Submission to the initiative of the Holy Spirit when he drops something in your heart is a great key. It's a key to everything in terms of practical day-to-day -day living. But I had that 
tremendous breakthrough. I had an experience in which uh, I felt that God was showing me something significant about a person as a non-Christian person. It was actually my dentist at the time. The dentist was a, a locum dentist, so he was just there for the two weeks that I needed treatment. And the first time I went there, it was by way of complaint because my regular dentist had left me with a problem. Go to the dentist and come back with a problem. It used to, it should be the other way around. And I was a bit irritated by this. And uh, anyway, in that state of a little bit of being a bit irritated and, you know, not, not necessarily feeling very spiritual, God dropped a word in my heart for that man, and I saw a, a revelation concerning his sister. And it was very early days, uh, and I was unsure. You've all been there, haven't you been there? Where you think, is this me, or is this the Lord, all right? And it's, it's about learning to recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit, like you learn to recognize one another voices. Can you imagine if I called the telephone home? Hi. Hello? Hi, Amanda. Who is this? <laughs> it's Colin. Oh, Colin. Oh, I didn't. I didn't recognize your voice. Well, that can happen sometimes with bad telephone lines. But, you know, even before I ring, she knows who it is. <laughs> because she's got so used to my way, she got so used to my voice. We recognize one another's voice because we spent time with one another. Anyway, I said, I don't know whether this is you, Lord, or whether this is me, I don't know. And just then the Holy Spirit was so gracious to me. I am so grateful because he knows I'm spiritually dumb. He knows I need extra extra grace and strong across my, my, I was going to say across my spirit, but that's kind of using a bit strange language, but, but deep within my soul, the words came, this is my voice. It was, it wasn't an audible sound, you understand me, but it was as clear as that. And when he said my voice, the, the voice of the Holy Spirit has become to me from that moment to this unmistakable. And if I do mistake it, it's because I've been careless or presumptuous or hasty. But the Holy Spirit speaks with such a distinctive voice, such a ring of clarity and authenticity, that once you've truly heard that, you will never forget it, and you can learn thereafter to discern His voice in every situation. But of course, we've got to be clear, none of us is infallible. And in fact, there is no gift or ministry of prophecy today, which is infallible. And that's something that many of my charismatic brothers and sisters and preachers and teachers in the world forget. They th sometimes the gift of prophecy is elevated, not just to be equal to Scripture, but above Scripture. But the Bible says prophecy is always below Scripture, submitted to Scripture, and through Scripture we can discern the false from the true. And even then in New Testament times, this gift was operating in that way. And after this, this breakthrough, out of that learning to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, came so much ministry and so much blessing. And I was grateful that we had, at that time, a senior minister who was a releasing minister. He wanted to release people into the gifts of God and encourage them in their ministry and to take up their place and their role within the body of Christ to be ministers and to grow and develop. Of course, you need to regulate 
as well as release. Every car you have will have both an accelerator and a brake. And you need both in order to drive. Can you imagine driving a car that only has a brake but no accelerator? You would get nowhere. Imagine having a car with an accelerator and no brake. You would get somewhere very fast, and it, <laughs> but it may not be your desired destination. So it is not wrong to regulate as long as you release. It's not wrong to release as long as you regulate. And sometimes when you start to regulate, people get very offended. And that is when you know what spirit they are really speaking by. I remember once there was a lady back in the days in old Pentecostal times when it was commonplace in the Sunday morning service for people to give a message in tongues. Quite extraordinary because tongues is a language that we don't understand. And therefore there is needed a gift of interpretation. And the Bible's teaching in my view is that tongues is more a, a, a worship language and a prayer language than it is a language of prophecy. But tongues and interpretation would be equivalent to prophecy under those circumstances. But every Sunday morning, she would work up like a, like a steam engine coming to boil and... <laughs> anyway, I won't, won't mimic it because it's, it's so funny I can't help uh, seeing the humor of it, but I want to make the serious point. Anyway, one day, Wynne Lewis, who was a great releaser but a brilliant regulator, said, lady, sit down. No, I won't. Sit down, lady. No, I won't. She said, he said, you will. You're not in the spirit. She said, you're quenching the spirit. And he said, you sure right I am. I'm quenching your spirit, lady. Sit down. Now, it's a long time since we've had those kind of confrontations in, in, in church life. But people who, who kind of puff themselves up, there is something that goes to people's heads when they think, I am speaking on behalf of God. Because you can't contradict that. It is one of the most controlling things that you could ever say to somebody, God has told me. And if God has not told them, you're in big trouble and they had better be the first ones to check it out and acknowledge if they've blown it and we all blow it. So we've got to test it. We've got to check it out. And, but, but you can always tell when, when people are ministering out of arrogance, ego, or even worse than that, is they refuse the correction of the Holy Spirit. And, and I've had this many, many, many times. Watch out for this. Um, what, what it is, is like this. People believe that they are speaking for and on behalf of God. They have not understood that their word is not gospel. Their word is a prophetic word which needs to be tested. And if you test it and find that it's, that it's not genuine or the elements of it which are suspect, they should be the first, if they are speaking by the Spirit, to recognize that and surrender and say, okay, let, let's, let's, let's clear this up. But those who say, no, 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 don't you know I'm a prophet? I'm speaking from God. And if you don't listen to me, then you're finished. Many, many times, a prophecy which is in a spirit of control, arrogance, and people are prophesying beyond the measure of what is even legitimate today, can hide behind this God told me. You know what? We've got to be very careful with God, this idea of God telling us. We use it so, so quickly. So God told me to marry this person. Yeah, and then when the divorce comes, you say, God told you to marry that person. Oh yeah, he's telling me now to divorce. <laughs> it's tragic, but it's, but it's real. And we've got to be very careful because sometimes people prophesy out of their own desires. Oh, the Lord is showing me that you're going to be my husband. <laughs> Amanda knows of a, a situation way back in one of the churches where um, a man went up to a lady in the church, um, I guess she was like 
kind of attractive, I guess. Okay, but let's not go there. But he, he, went, he went to her and said, the Lord has shown me you to be my wife. And she said, that's remarkable because he told that to my husband. <laughs> Now, um, again, let me just give you another illustration to show you why we must be cautious. Um, you see, we've got to know our Bibles. If you know your Bible, you, you will find it relatively easy to discern because the Scripture gives us discernment. When you read your Bible, not just to get to know it in detail, but also to read large chunks at a time. I had a Bible reading program at one stage in my life to come to this place where reading the Bible so much, I mean, four times a year kind of thing. And after that time, you, you, you somehow get into the, into, into touch, in touch with the character of God, not just the detail of this verse and that verse, but you get the idea of what the real voice of God sounds like when they are testing counterfeit notes, they don't study the fake, they study the real thing so they can spot the fake immediately. So we get ourselves into, into the Word of God um, and we, we learn how to test and discern and we, we become very careful. Somebody said to me, oh, you can't judge my prophecies, I'm 80% correct. Okay, tell you a story. I'm making it up. It's an illustration. Suppose you go to the corner shop. You say, can I have a can of Coke, please? Yes, which can would you like? Any can. So, well, I've got a hundred up there. Which one do you want? Well, I don't know. Does it matter? Well, it may not matter. It may matter. Because I know, the shopkeeper says, that 20 cans of Coke have been poisoned. Which ones? I don't know. But I can tell you this. If you take a can of Coke from the shelf, I can guarantee you are 80% safe. <laughs> you have a 20% probability of being dead, but 80% safe. <laughs> we cannot allow any one thing to enter. We must move in the genuine. Now, that doesn't mean to say that every prophecy has to be perfect. But as long as we understand what, how prophecy operates, that God is speaking, but it is not something so authoritative that we have to take it down as gospel, but we get a gist of what God is saying. Do you understand me? Um, I'm going to talk more about that, the actual practical use of prophecy, and then we're going to do it in two weeks' time when I'm next speaking, Sunday night, the 22nd of um, September. I'll be teaching on the practical side of how we operate in this gift. And, and we're going to have a prophetic presbytery. We're going to have people who are seeking God, preparing to come, and they will be available if God wishes to use them to speak, bring a word in your life. And it will be recorded, so there's accountability. We've done this before. We'll explain more about that later. And it's just a way of saying to people, you know, God speaks this way. We're going to give him an opportunity. We're not, not going to neglect all the other disciplines of hearing God for ourselves. We're not going to neglect the disciplines of getting to know God through loving obedience, through, through the scriptures. But we're going to allow time for the Holy Spirit to encourage us in this way, not to despise prophecies. In fact, to desire the prophetic ministry and to learn how to handle it aright in a mature way. So, in this passage, there is a context, and uh, when we talk about prophecies, it, it comes under another heading. Do you know what I'm saying? It, it's, it's not the headline. Prophecy is not the headline. It, it's part of a bigger package. And so when the Apostle Paul says, do not quench the Spirit, that's his theme. It's not just about prophecy. 
is about a whole lot of other things. Let's see that briefly before we bring this to conclusion today. Turn back to 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 to 21. I suggest to you verse 19 is the main point. The main point. Be open to the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit loose in your life. Be aware of His presence. Learn to listen to Him. Allow Him to shape your life. And then Paul is talking about three ways in which that should happen. And in the midst of this, prophecy has a part. It's not everything and it's not nothing. It's beautiful in its right place. And so what is it that Paul says will quench the Holy Spirit? If he says, don't quench the Spirit, he's telling us how we may sometimes quench the Spirit and how to avoid quenching the Spirit. And in that passage, there are three ways in which we avoid quenching the Holy Spirit. Number one, in our attitude to our leaders. Number two, in our attitude to one another. Number three, in our attitude to God himself. And you can see that number three is the most important. Paul is climbing a ladder there. Sometimes we go from the most important statement and we go down the ladder. Here he's going up the ladder because this is what it's all about. All of this is about your relationship with God. Do you know how you approach prophecy is a signal of your relationship with God. And so he says, first of all, don't quench the spirit in your attitude to leaders. Now, it's not my sermon. It's just about the context. But he says, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So in other words, the right attitude that's not quenching the spirit is to acknowledge those whom the Holy Spirit has placed in leadership and ministry. Amen? Amen. And yet so often, the so-called prophets, the first people they attack is the leadership because they're not really speaking from God. And this is how the enemy is using them. I'm not saying they're all demonic, but I'm just saying the lack of wisdom actually brings division and divides the church. Leaders ought to be corrected when they need to be corrected. But it's not a free for all for every prophet who says, if you don't listen to me, then God has got it in for you. So much worse for you. In fact, one of these people came to my office a long time ago. <laughs> Didn't happen this week. And uh, it was the time when I was having a breakthrough. Not a breakdown, a breakthrough. Uh, and breakthrough in these things are so wonderful. And Wynne Lewis was releasing me. And I, I'm pretty sure that the gift was quite immaturely developed. And, you, you, you know, so I'm not, not saying, you know, I was a full rounded minister in the Holy Spirit. And that's what it's all about. We have to grow. We have to begin somewhere. But there were real things happening. And it was so exciting. And uh, so back in the day, I think there was just, Wynne Lewis, myself, there might have been somebody else. Was there a dog or a cat? I can't remember. But it was a very small team. And we all used to fit into that room behind reception. That was the church office. And it was my responsibility to be there. And uh, I was receiving people for counseling and um, taking inquiries. It was wonderful. And one day, God spoke to me. I want to explain what I mean by God speaking, but it spoke to me very clearly. I had this sense in my heart that God was saying something, and it seemed to be along these lines. Somebody is coming this week to talk to you, but please know I haven't sent them. I thought, okay, that's nice. Thank you, Lord. Heads up there. That's great. And sure enough, this prophetic person um, let me just be rude a little bit, this pathetic person, but this prophetic person came to the office and within the first few moments, I could tell 
Not only was her language so destructive, it was also so against the Holy Spirit. It was one of those people who had a problem in this way. And, and there were, it, it, it was terrible, really was. And you know, when you first start out, yeah? When you first start out, you need encouragement, you need correction, but you need encouragement. And there are some people who, who try and they never do it again because they're not in a, an environment where they can learn and be encouraged and begin to do things and grow. But I was not discouraged. I was not deflected from a pathway of life in the Spirit and learning not just to give a prophetic word from time to time, but that would take me eventually into the nations of the world with literally hundreds of thousands of people under the sound of my voice on any given occasion. Maybe you guys don't know very much about that in the little uh, storyline that I'm doing a video to show you next month. You will see some of the ministry, the signs and the wonders and the miracles and the crowds in different revival centers in the world. And it all comes back to this, hearing his voice and obeying him. So we thank God that he gives us encouragement in this way. And attitude to leaders is a sign of spirituality. A good attitude to leaders is a sign of spirituality. Even if there's a point of disagreement, it's not saying you've got to believe and agree with everything, but your attitude towards that is so very important. Honoring them, loving them. And the worst thing you can do is to try to divide them and become little partisan groups about this leader or that leader. As Paul writes to the Corinthians, say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Peter, I'm of Apollos. No, we are of Christ. So attitude to leaders is a mark of true spirituality and openness to the Spirit. But our attitude to one another is also important. You see what he says? Uh, be at peace among yourselves. We need to pray for Parliament. I'm sorry, I've gone straight from church to Parliament. When I think about the need for peace, I think of Parliament. One of the prime ministers used to host ministers in number 10, had us for a, a time together, and he started his speech like this. He said, you know, an old Methodist preacher used to say to me, when I see the state of the nation, I pray for Parliament. And then this Prime Minister said, now when I see the state of Parliament, I pray for the nation. <laughs> and so, peace, peace. Learning to be tolerant and open, let the Holy Spirit take control. Away with criticism and division, peace among yourselves. And it's all it re requires, the kind of things that are open to us in the cell groups. We urge you, brothers, He's talking to the church. You, brothers, this is your work. Admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See no one replays evil for evil. Always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Hallelujah. I mean, I would like to be part of a church like that. Uh, well, I am. Amen? That's what we want. And that is not quenching the spirit if you don't follow this, we're likely to quench the Spirit if we treat one another badly. And then the real point, um, your attitude towards God, and he describes it. It's not my sermon, but it's the context. Rejoice always. That's a good start. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. So I like all of that. But now under that category of our attitude to God comes this exhortation. Don't despise prophecies. But can you see it's in the context of a church that is in relationship with the Holy Spirit, each other, that honors its leaders and that most of all loves God. And when that context is right, the ministry of the Spirit flows so much more easily. So what am I saying today? 
Prophecy is something to welcome. Amen? It's something to embrace. It's something to enjoy. There are disciplines and corrections with it, but, but we thank God for it. It is a genuine gift from God. So all the more reason to make sure that the genuine manifestations of the Spirit are occurring. It must be tested. There is a prophetic process. Yes. Talk more about that next time. How this gift operates, how we can handle it. Be more practical about that next time in the final message. But for now, what I want you to go away with is this. I want to encourage you to be a good listener to the Holy Spirit. To learn to hear God. In my prophetic introduction, or the Holy Spirit's introduction to prophecy in my life, the words came this way. There was something to pass on, something to pass on. And I was so happy passing them on until one day I got one for me. I would suggest it's usually the other way around. We get one for us. God speaks to our hearts. We might share that with somebody and encourage them. If it encouraged you, it may encourage somebody else. But then there comes a moment when God gives you a word and it is a word for somebody else. You do it with caution, with respect, with humility, with care. But it is a message, a word for somebody else. And you will be surprised how God will use you to give you a word. It may not sound very profound. It may not be there'll be three earthquakes before breakfast tomorrow because God loves you. It may not be that dramatic. But if it is a specific thing that the Holy Spirit has dropped in your spirit so you can speak it to somebody else with love and a motivation of encouragement, you will be so blessed and others will be blessed. I want to encourage you to become a good listener, to learn to hear God, and to pass on what is helpful and encouraging. And I finish this off with the same verse that I quoted in the last message at the end of the message. Isaiah 50 verse 4. And this is what we aspire to. The Lord has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with a word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens. He awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. It may just be that the Lord has laid on your heart a scripture verse for somebody. It doesn't have to be close your Bible and ask God what he's saying. No, God will use so many things. But as we begin to more increasingly, more than ever before, learn how to encourage one another with the words that God give us, gives us that we can pour out encouragement to people. You, you will be astonished how sometimes the simple word, very timely, from the Holy Spirit, will be just the thing that person needs at that moment, in time of need, in time of crisis, or in time of decision. And God, who speaks through people, wants to speak through you. Amen, amen and amen. amen. God bless you, everybody.